Welcome to uh, Attracting Native Pollinators uh, with Blackstone Veggie, Valley Veggie Gardens and the Paul Pratt Memorial Library. This is Kate Donovan, who is the garden coach at Blackstone. Um, and we are so thankful to have her here. We originally scheduled this for March or April. Uh, of course, the virus uh, made made us close the library, but uh, thankfully we've been able to reschedule this series of um, lectures. Last week we had Russ Cohen, uh, who gave a lecture on edible plants in native to the Cohasset area where we are located. And that will be on our YouTube channel, on the library channel, as well as this one. We are recording this. Um, so I just wanted to say a little something about uh, Blackstone Veggie Valley, Valley Veggie Gardens. <laughs> um, they specialize in training, consulting, and assisting with um, vegetable gardens. Um, and uh, they do this through a series of um, soil testing, uh, lectures and workshops, and garden planning. Uh, as you all know, uh, you can <clears throat> grow vegetables and fruits in containers, raised beds, or in ground gardens. And I hope you'll all enjoy the wonderful information that we're going to get today from, from Kate. I wanted to give a very special welcome to Kate and a uh, and special uh, shout out to uh, the Community Garden Club of Cohasset, who has generously sponsored this series of events. So why don't I let you take over, Kate? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. So I'm going to share my screen now. Oops, share my screen. All right. Okay. Okay. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. No, that's not it. Uh, down at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse, yep. there might be oh, something down there. Let me see. Okay, hold on. Bear with me here. Thank you for being patient with us while we yes, hold on, <laughs> hold on. our technical difficulties here. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, I'll bring this up. There we go. I'm going to share my. Okay. And I'm going to do. Share my screen. And for some reason, it does not seem to be coming up. <clears throat> okay, hold on a minute here. Oh, okay, here we go. There we go. Very good. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about why I, oops. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Yes, befriending the pollinators. Yep, yep. So let's talk about um, what we're going to, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Okay, so I basically, you know, there's two, there's, there's several different types of lecturers and people who care about growing in plant life. We have conservationists who uh, care very much about, um, you know, our native environment, et cetera. And then we have horticulturalists more like myself who like to garden and grow things and, and see what we can do with the environment to help ourselves and help people and grow food. Um, but as a horticulturalist, I also care very much about our environment and about our pollinators and, and, um, and, and what we can do to preserve our, our pollinators. So, and we all hear about, um, you know, habitat loss. Um, we hear about colony collapse for the, for the bees. So, um, so I just wanna, you know, I figure if I talk a little bit about these uh, native pollinators, maybe you'll grow an affinity for them. I have, it's, as, I, as I was saying, it's my birthday today, and um, 
I just, I'm so touched because I get a, a very special little birthday greeting um, via Facebook from my granddaughter. And I, I talk about her because she's the, the light of my life and she's three. And, um, and I have, when she used to see the bees on the, on the, um, the raspberries out there, she would just jump. And I said, Bella, these bees are your friend. What you do when you see a bee is you leave it alone. And if you're scared, what you can do is just watch him and you'll see him work so hard to try to make your yard beautiful with your flowers and to try to give you food because they eat the pollen and then they help you grow food. So in any case, uh, we have to teach them when they're young, so. Okay, so we're gonna talk about bees today and we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about a couple of other things. They don't pollinate quite as well, but they're interesting as well. We'll talk about the uh, butterflies in our area and also we'll concentrate a little on the monarch butterflies because their habitat is in, in, in real trouble. So, and we'll also talk about our friend, we've actually, um, seen a couple of them in our areas, and that's the um, the hummingbird. We have several different types of hummingbirds in the world, but only one is native to New England, and I'll explain a little bit about that one as well. So, and there's our lovely bee. So, um, so first of all, as I say, it's the same rule with my, I told my Bella, um, so whether it's a yellow jacket that looks very much like a bee or whether it's a humble bumble, uh, the, the rule is the same. You don't touch them. You just leave them to do what they're doing. Don't try to run. They fly, they fly a lot faster than you can uh, possibly run. Um, but the yellow jackets are, yellow jackets are um, uh, mistakenly you know, thought of as bees, but they're not, they're actually wasps and they'll still sting you. Um, the nest uh, can hold up to 1,500 soldiers. They do eat bad bugs in your garden and they eat aphids and a lot of bad stuff, but they don't, fall, they don't pollinate very well because they're not very fuzzy. Uh, and a lot of times people see them, them, and they're small, they're about, I'd say the same size as a honeybee and they look very much like a honeybee except they have bright yellow legs. Uh, so you may think they are, I remember one time last year, I have several raised beds and I also have several containers and some of them have, they're self-watering and they have uh, bottoms, uh, bottoms to them that are hollow until I water it. But um, one, uh, one yellow jacket uh, family decided they were gonna move in there without telling me. So I went in and um, went to find out why nothing was growing in that in that container and started digging and they all came out and of course they swarmed me because you know their habitat was in danger so i i came in the house and two of them two of them followed me and i actually had to squirt some some with the hose outside i got stung about five times but after that i just let them be literally pardon the pun i let them be i gave them that uh, I gave them that uh, plant for the rest of the year. So, um, and that, cause I don't like to kill anything. So typically um, you just leave them alone. I still remember when I was, um, I had my first house, I had little kids and up on the top of the a telephone pole, I could see the, the, uh, the hornets, this is hornets, not just yellow jackets, yellow jackets live in the ground as do bees. Um, but these were hornets swarming up there. And I actually called, I didn't know who to call. I said, who do you call? You know, I'm afraid they're going to uh, swarm after my kids. And I called the animal control, figuring they'd have some kind of input. And what they said was, they're on, the tele they're on top of the telephone pole. They don't attack, just leave them alone. And that's what I did. Uh, and and uh, we, we got along fine. So, okay. So I want to show you this, um, and this this was um, let's see here, yeah. this was um, uh, at a restaurant near my house, and this is about this time of year. So they planted a beautiful perennial perennial garden. It had um, a lot of um, uh, daisies and salvia and a lot of other perennials. And I I sat right next to. Her. I was waiting for my son to come because you're going to go in and and grab a burger, but watch closely and you'll see 
just how many how many uh, humble bumbles you can actually count because there were literally dozens and dozens within a, a very small area. Their nest must have been close, but they're just so uh, so um, interesting to watch. And they're busy. Jumping from flower to flower, holding the paw. They're so fuzzy like little toothbrushes. All the pollen is on their bellies. So they're eating the pollen going from flower to flower and that pollen rubs off from the male flower into the female flower. And that's how we get uh, the pollination from the bees. I wish I had a better camera at this time, but I had to use my phone. Sometimes you do what, do what you have to do. That's enough of that. Okay, so there are some, some crops that we have that every time you eat one, whether you grow it or get it from the farmer's market or get it from market basket, you should thank the bees that actually pollinated it. And just to name a few, we have apples, peaches, plums, cherries, melons, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, um, <clears throat> raspberries, cranberries, onions, beans, sunflower, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, turnips, Brussels sprouts, beets, and pumpkin. Just Those are just a few that we rely on our pollinators for. So people don't realize, and we've had a, such a massive decline uh, in bees, people don't realize that we, we really need them. And if we had a hand pollinator or figure out some other way to do it, we'd really be... <laughs> In, in deep trouble, so. Okay, so um, I was shocked when I, so being a, being a person, as I say, who was a horticulturalist, I, I, grow, I grow things and I like to figure out how to grow things without doing too much damage to the earth. Um, so I, I never really took a, a, a huge, I don't have, I didn't have a huge knowledge um, of of nature and and how how it makes things how, how what a closed loop it is closed loop system but um, so in the so as far as bees goes in 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 southern New England where we live here there are three hundred and seventy different varieties of bees so just to review that 370 different families of bees. And as I say, that doesn't include wasps or yellow jackets or hornets or any of that. So 370 different varieties. And the vast majority of them um, that, that you see, you might not even recognize them as bees. For example, a lot of times when you're out in the garden or doing something when it's warm, you, you uh, tend to perspire um, and you, you, little, you think they're little fruit flies or whatever they come. Well, they're not fruit flies, they're actually sweat bees. And um, so, so that's, that's one type of bee is the sweat bee. But in any case, uh, the vast majority of bees uh, don't live in nests, they actually live in the ground. Um, and um, so a lot of times, you know, somebody will step on, step on a nest and then they'll be in trouble, but that's about the only time they'll ever attack you. And some bees can't even, don't even have stingers. So let's, let's look at a few different types and what they, what they like and what you grow in your yard and what you have in your environment, okay? So um, the first one is Adrenidae, and I may be pronouncing it wrong. Those are mining bees and, and mining bees and minor bees, okay? What do they eat? They eat butterfly weed, milkweed. I have milkweeds. Anyone have milkweed? Anyone else have milkweed? Um, nipplewort, eastern blue coneflower, iox, uh, common birds, foot trefoil, Canadian goldenrod, 
Italian clover, white clover, dandelion, other clovers, and vetch. So I just want to tell you, talk a little bit about this, just a, a little bit. So I, I, I explained this three different, 370 different kinds of bees, and the vast majority, including the humble bumble, uh, live in the ground. So in the every every spring, um, I'm inundated with the nasty dandelions. I know they're superfoods. You know, you can take them. You can eat just about any part of the dandelions that you want. And you can come and get mine as well while you're at it. But I refuse to use any kind of chemicals on my lawn. So the bees love it. So they come out of the, they come out of the ground and the first thing they feed on is stuff that's close to the ground. So this is why, you know, you, you find your clover. I have a ton of clover in my garden right now that I, I don't want, but of course, uh, the bees like it. So in dandelion, um, so they, they, they love the, the flowers that are close to the ground. They also like the goldenrod. And uh, of course, um, that'll, make you, that'll make you sneeze. Not as bad as people think, but it, but it does make you sneeze. So, uh, so th there's another kind. Those are the apidae uh, bees. And um, they are social and solitary. And when, I'm, when I say a social bee, I mean a bee that has that whole uh, that whole uh, society set up around the queen. Honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and more are in this family. Um, of all of those, just to tell you a little bit about the honeybee, the honeybee is not native uh, to New England. The honeybee is not native to North America. The honeybee is native to Europe. So in, in essence, it doesn't really belong in this presentation, but it's so important to us that I, that I put it in here nonetheless. I very rarely see a honeybee. Honeybees cannot exist in nature. Uh, they're a completely different uh, type of bee and they, and they only exist um, in, in domestication. Uh, of course, they take off once in a while, but they don't live long outside. They are exceptionally good. Uh, they will, they will um, fly off a mile or two miles from the hive and they will somehow or another, I don't know how, how they do it, but somehow or another, uh, Mother Nature grants them with the, uh, the sense to find their ways back to, to the hive. They're awesome pollinators. They're also the only, because uh, they're honeybees, they're the only bee that actually produces honey. Uh, I shouldn't say that bumblebees also produce honey, but they only produce enough to sustain themselves. So, so you'll, you'll see a few honeybees if, that they've escaped and gone rogue from the nest and then most of them will, will go back. Um, but the, the ones that I like the best are the other bumblebees and that's the one that you saw in the, in the, in the, the, the little film clip that I showed. The bumblebees um, are, are pretty much the biggest ones in our area. Uh, they will not sting you. And, and that's why when I, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna stand my three-year-old granddaughter outside of you know, my blackberry bush or my blueberries with dozens of, oh, the raspberries as well, with dozens of bumblebees and tell her she can stand there quietly and watch, you have to understand, I'm pretty sure that the bumblebees will not attack. The only way they'll attack is uh, if you step on the nest. Um, but the honeybees, a honeybee can only sting you once. And, and if it doesn't want to sting you because if it does sting you, it will lose the, uh, the, uh, the stinger will stay in you and it will actually kill the honeybee. So they don't want that. Bumblebees can actually sting you more than once. They have no vested interest. They have no desire to attack a creature that's 8 million times bigger than itself and to lose their lives over it. They'll only do it if they're trying to protect their hive or the queen. Um, carpenter bees, you'll see carpenter bees, um, and they call them carpenter bees um, pretty much because they can actually bore into wood, which is bad. Um, they can bore in, into wood and, and cause a lot of damage to the, to the environment around them. Um, however, carpenter bees don't sting. So they do damage, as I say, to your home or what have you, but they have no stingers. And you can see them, they're big. They're almost like a bumblebee, um, but the butt is shiny. As you can see over here on this, uh, this bumblebee, you can see it has a, 
a, a, a fluff, it's all fluffy all over, which makes it so cute. So, um, so anyway, what do they eat? They eat uh, giant uh, high sop, uh, buckwheat, lupine, which is wild and all throughout New England, wild bergamot. They eat a species of rose, Canadian goldenrod, uh, dandelion again, ironweed. So you see some commonalities. They both have the goldenrod and they both like the dandelion. They, both, they, both types, the mining bees, minor bees, honeybees, bumblebees. So it's, I guess it's a good thing to grow dandelions. Like I say, if you want some, you can, you can uh, come and get mine. So I had a, fr a customer of mine who's a garden I built. She was, her father was looking for organic dandelion um, to, to plant. The whole thing is you can dig up any dandelion, but of course it's been out by the road. It could, you know, it's not clean. It could have all kinds of junk on it. So, but in any case, I did find a guy right in Northridge, Massachusetts that actually has a stock of dandelion greens for those who like it. They make wine out of it, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, um, the next type of bee that we have is Colette Day, and that's a family of solitary bees uh, and that has, that has 2,500 uh, species, discovered species. Obviously, we don't have all those species here in New England, uh, but it is quite a large family of bees. Um, they, they feed semi-solid pollen balls to their young, and that would be the plaster bee and the mast bee. And they also eat the, gold, the Canadian goldenrod in, uh, in a, a species of the rose family. Um, so we have the Helicidae family, and those are the ones I told you about, very small in their, in their sweat, sweat bees. Uh, they live in the ground, but you do find some nesting in wood. And what do they eat? Uh, butterfly weed, black-eyed Susan. We saw some black-eyed Susan in that little clip. Sunflower, coneflower, buttercups, milkweed, clover. Again, the Canadian goldenrod, lilac, and giant blue hyssop. So... You can find some commonal commonalities there, and uh, hopefully you grow something in your environment that could attract some bees. So something else, um, we have another one, leaf cutters and mason bees. They go for blueberries, cranberries, giant blue hyssop, clover, and ironweed. So, okay. All right, so this is an interesting picture. On the left is what the bee sees. On the right is what you and I see. So bees see in ultraviolet wavelengths. This is bee balm under an ultraviolet light. Okay, so giving you the ability to see what a bee sees when it sees a beautiful plant. So you see um, on, on here, on, on the leaves here where my, where my mouse is, you see uh, a pathway that's white. So they just follow the white and that's where the pollen is. So it shows them right where dinner is. It's kind of like us going into the kitchen and seeing the plate there full. Um, so it shows them exactly how to get to their food. So that, that their vision is very different. Their eyes are actually more complex. They have more cones in them. And um, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so Another thing that you can, uh, if you try to remember when you see, and that's another thing interesting, you know, it's, it's I think it's a great thing to, to have this little girl, as I say, my granddaughter, spending time with her, um, of course, not much lately, um, but it's interesting to see things in the eyes of a, through the eyes of a child. And she's looking at these bees and she's saying, they don't stand still, Grammy. And they don't, they work so, so hard. Sometimes they exhaust themselves and collapse and die. So what happens is if you want to be so kind, you can actually leave them a drink that they can enjoy. So um, what you do for the bees, as we said, most of them live on the, in the ground. So you can select a shallow dish for your bee bath, a nice piece of pottery, or it doesn't have to be nice, doesn't have to be pretty, but if you have those beautiful flowers you want to attract them to, you might want something that's kind of attractive. So pick a dish that's blue, white, or yellow, because those are the colors that the bees are attracted to. Um, sprinkle some gravel or small pebbles in the bottom of the dish. The reason you're, you're doing that is so the bees will have an opportunity to 
stand on something while they're drinking through their through their mouth, um, or they'll just they could fall in and, and die because they're just so exhausted. Uh, so sprinkle gravel, small pebbles in the bottom of the dish, fill the dish with water, stopping just short of the stones. You'll see the, the photos there. These rocks will serve as the landing spot for the bees, uh, hopefully making this new bath more attractive. And place the bee bath in a nice quiet place in your environment. And here's a pretty one where somebody did it and they actually put blue, st blue marbles in there. So you can pretty it up if you want or you can keep it basic. I think maybe your neighbors, you know, would appreciate something pretty, but the bees really don't care. So as I say, they're attracted to uh, the, the blues, white, and, blues, white, and light yellow. Those are the colors that they see best. So, okay, so let's look at the perennial wildflowers that are out there. And actually at the end of this presentation, I, I, I'm more than welcome to send you this presentation and I'll give you my email. And if I have your name or uh, if we, we have a list, I'll, I'll definitely send this presentation in the, uh, the uh, form, uh, the PowerPoint form. So um, we see uh, lupine is very pretty. I like, I like lupine and it grows all the way north to the northern part of Canada at least. I mean, northern part of Maine anyway, probably into Canada, I'm not sure. Uh, but they're very pretty and you see a lot of, a lot of the bees like dandelion. I just, I'm dying to, every year I'm dying to, you know, mow my lawn and pull them out. I pull them up by hand, oops, pull them up by hand. Um, but, uh, but they are good for the bees. The goldenrod as well, they like the yellow and then the ironweed. So those are just four uh, different types of flowers that would entice more than one different type of bee. To your, to your area. Okay, so I wanna show you this, um, um, the, the monarch. Just, just watch how beautiful it is as it's flying. Hi gang, Alan from Ultra Slow. Butterflies, I just love butterflies. Butterflies help pollinate flowers the same way the bees do by going from flower to flower, carrying the pollen, and helping to ensure that we have food. Unfortunately, just like the bees, the butterflies are dying off. So let's try and limit our pesticides, limit the bug sprays, and uh, watch and enjoy how the butterfly goes from flower to flower. You can see their long curved tongue or mouth part that looks like a little semicircle in front of them as they fly off. They extend that down into the flower and you get to see them drink the nectar from each flower. How many birds do the same thing? It's a long clip of just beautiful images of butterflies. Enjoy. Everyone to go to sleep that was very relaxing was <laughs> watching those. So um, it is just nice to see things that we could never see on our own because, of course, butterflies literally flutter by, so we can never see anything in such a graceful uh, manner in flight. So, in any case, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so, here are some of the butterflies that, that I've, and I've seen quite a few of them, um, as you can see up in the the top uh, left, you see the, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, the top left, you see the black swallowtail. I've seen, I've seen several of those. Um, on the bottom, uh, on the bottom uh, left, the, uh, the, uh, the eastern swallowtail, I've seen, uh, we have plenty of swallowtails out there, right uh, in my backyard. 
the Canadian swallowtail, and then um, then the one on the bottom. I can't see it. Um, okay. Then we, and I've seen these, the white sulfur, the American chopper, and um, we see these other ones as well. And they all start out as uh, caterpillars, as you can see. They look very little like the, um, the, 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 the parent once it emerges from the cocoon. So, okay, so, and so that's, so we have several different types of but butterflies here. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the monarchs because we see quite a few monarchs, okay? They, uh, they're the most incredible. Um, so some, it almost, it almost makes you believe that there has to be some kind of a higher power or something that can actually uh, figure all this out because these monarchs migrate every year over 3,000 miles from Mexico all the way to Canada and back again um, for, the, for the fall. But the same butterfly doesn't because it takes four generations to migrate through, at least four generations to migrate through that trek. So they're born with the instinct to, uh, to, to do it. They reproduce along the way. Um, and the way they do it, they only reproduce, well, the monarch lays its eggs only on the milkweed. So um, they, they lay their eggs on the milkweed for a reason. The milkweed is toxic to a lot of uh, other insects in the environment. So they, that's why they lay their, their, their eggs there because figuring that nothing will eat it. And that works most of the time. So you see, and I, I haven't really seen it this year so much. This year I've seen a whole lot of people, as I say, getting into their own sustainability. But in the last couple of years, you've seen a lot of people that have monarch uh, little, little uh, like a terrarium that they actually build them in and they watch them, the cocoons grow and all that. and. Um, they actually harvest a lot of the uh, milkweed for them and um, kind of help try to, to try to help them along because they've had 90% of their environment uh, has been decimated. So let's, let's learn a little bit about, so, it, so let's learn a little bit about that. The, so the habitat loss in the United States and, and Mexico has been a main threat to the North American monarch population. After decades of effort, Mexico curbed the deforestation in the butterflies' winter habitat um, in the fir and the pine forests in, in Mexico. But the loss of milkweed in the United States uh, continues to be a major issue, scientists say. Uh, that's the plant that the monarch, as I stated, lays its eggs on. Um, and it's used to spring up between the rows of corn, soybeans, and other commercial crops. So keep that in mind. The milkweed, which is a weed, really it's a weed, and it's not very pretty either. I have some, I should have brought it in and showed everybody, but it used to uh, spring up between the corn, the soybeans and commercial crops. So not to spread FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt, but um, those are the crops, soybean, corn, uh, that, that are being sprayed, that, that, that are being grown GMO uh, in order to be resistant to pesticides. And then, um, of course, the pesticides that are sprayed uh, don't affect the GMO corn or the soybeans, but they kill off all the milkweed that's growing in the same field. So because of the pesticide use and uh, the GMO uh, process uh, that's happening in commercial farming, um, that's what's uh, contributing to the loss of the uh, milkweed and therefore the loss of the habitat of the monarch. So today many farmers plant farmers plant herbicide resistant crops because uh, it allows them to spray the fields with powerful chemicals such as Roundup, killing the milkweed in the process. Last year, the number of monarchs that migrated to Mexico was the lowest record ever, covering a mere 0.67 hectares of forest 
down from 21 hectares in 1996, 97 season. So if somebody says we need Roundup and pesticides, maybe we do, uh, but the monarchs sure don't, let's put it that way. So that's what, oops, that's what, um, oops, why is that doing that? Okay, so that's all right. I'm gonna give you a quick one and then we'll move on from there. That's what the, the uh, milkweed looks like, okay. So, so the wildflowers that you use to attract butterflies. This is important to understand the difference between what the plant eats and a host plant because milkweed is the home where the, where the, uh, the, the butterflies lay their eggs, they don't eat it. Uh, but the goldenrod, the queen ants lays in the butterfly bush, that's what they eat. So in theory, um, you should have, when you do have a milkweed to host the butterflies, um, you can also uh, incorporate that with some queen ants lace. Lord knows I've had a hard time getting rid of mine. It's, a, it's in the carrot family. Um, so when you, when you uh, if you have the milkweed, have some queen ants lace. So not only do the, uh, uh, the, do the butterflies have a place to lay their eggs, but they also have something to eat. So, so those are wildflower, wildflowers that you can grow to attract the butterflies. So I wanna show you this um, to, uh, to go to the last of our uh, piece of the presentation, which is on the ruby-throated hummingbird. The ruby-throated hummingbird is the only bird that we have uh, that's native to, uh, to New England, the only hummingbird we have here. So let me just show you this interesting to watch. Watch his neck, see how it glows red? And that's the male. Of course, the female is much more, um, she's much more uh, uh, neutral color because she has to protect the, the nest. I don't know what they're talking about, but it sounds like they sure are having a good time. See that, let me. Okay, so um, just a couple of interesting facts about the, the hummingbird. They are pollinators. And you, as you can see, they have, they have a long beak that kind of resembles the, uh, works the same way as the proboscis of the butterfly. So they like the flowers that are long and cone shaped. I have some beautiful Asiatic lilies that I'm sure they'll enjoy. I'm not sure if they're native or not, but. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're one of my favorite flowers. So you see the female ruby-throated hummingbird and she has to be neutral in order for her to protect the nest. And then you see the pretty male, okay? The ruby-throated hummingbird is a species of hummingbird that spends the winter in Central America, Mexico, and Florida and migrates up here. And I think we see them um, in May. I have this a friend of mine who is she has all perennial flowers. I mean, she's an awesome, awesome gardener. She has all kinds of perennial flowers. And um, they migrate here to Eastern North, North America for the summer to breed. Uh, and it's the only one basically we have here. So they are um, 2.8 to 3.5 inches tall. Their wingspan is 3.1 to 4.3 inches and they weigh about four grams. So they're very, very lightweight. Okay, so adults are, the males are metallic green and grayish white below with almost black wings. The wings, you, you can, they sound like a little toy helicopter because 
what you can hear is those wings flapping. And also, interestingly enough, um, they don't stand, they don't walk very often because their legs are very underdeveloped and spindly and can't hold their body weight. So if they, if, so the, most of the time they spend in flight. So I don't know how they do it. Boy, I'd be tired after two minutes, but, um, but they, they seem to do pretty well with it. They have a lifespan of about seven years. So uh, we have some, what people do, I have hummingbirds in my areas. I have woods out in the back. I have natural flora and fauna um, here. Uh, what some people do is they, they get a um, bird feeder and they feed them with um, sugar, white sugar and water. And I think they color it in red because I think they like the color red, excuse me. Zoe, excuse me. Be quiet. What? Lisa, get this dog. Sorry about that. That was the beagle. You would have known it if it was the great, if it was the English mastiff, because she's kind of intimidating sounding, but they're both sweet. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the, um, the, the hummingbirds, so. So to, to attract the hummingbirds, okay? So a lot of the, a lot of the they have this, as you can see in the, in the bottom, um, over the, the bottom left-hand uh, corner you see, uh, they like the, the, a lot of the flowers that are cone-shaped because they can stick their little beaks right in there. So uh, they do eat uh, salvia, columbine, honeysuckle, and pink turtle head, which I've never seen. I guess it's a wildflower. That's probably why. Um, but you will see them. Like I say, some people feed them. I don't know if it's good for the environment that people feed them. I, I'm not sure. I would assume that if they can come naturally uh, and be enticed um, by the natural flowers and uh, in your area, that, uh, that that would be better. But who am I to say, right? So a lot of people like like to um, to put the feeders up. So, okay. So, um, in summary, okay. In order to entice native pollinators, grow a lot of flowers, including the organic wildflowers. And that's another thing I want to just mention. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get to it already. Um, not to preach, um, but I have a lot of clients, and um, you know, a lot of clients have beautiful gardens, a lot of weeds, and a lot of the a lot of them, you know, the first inclination is to use uh, a chemical um, herbicide on there because they're only flowers. I mean, no one eats them, but this isn't true. The bees consume them and, and other wildlife consumes them as well. So I prefer to use um, organic, uh, I, I prefer to feed the wildlife as I prefer to feed myself, which is the best quality food that that I can get. So, um, so the, another point is, um, since many bees live in the ground, don't forget the flowering low plants like simple dandelions and clover. So for butterflies and hummingbirds, they enjoy flowers they can stick their long snouts into. Uh, picture long, long thin flowers like a, a tiger lily, that they could go in and grab that pollen. Hummingbirds also see in near ultraviolet light, which, why, which is why colors as bright red, pink, or orange stand out more easily to them. Many fruits and vegetables, flowers and seeds are colored brightly. They stand out to animals and hummingbirds and insects more so than humans. Lisa! Hold on, sorry. While Kate is uh, uh, doing that, I uh, just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, type them in the chat box um, and she'll get to them before the end of the session today. Very sorry about that. Okay. All right. So um, 
It's a great idea to harvest your own wildflowers as, they, as you cut them off in the fall. Um, so to make sure you keep them going. And you can even take those, those wildflowers and make them so they're not so wild. You can also you know, cultivate them as long as you save the seeds um, and you just you know, see, sow them again in the place that you want them. So you can take the wildflowers and kind of train them to work within your own personal environment to help the, uh, you know, to help beautify your environment, to help pollinate your crops and your other flowers. And, um, and um, so that's, that's my ideas on that. Okay, so another uh, piece of the, in summary, um, we, we prefer to stay away from weed killers. Weed killers, um, also known as herbicides. So, Weed killers are things like uh, Roundup and that kind of stuff. You, you, you choose to stay away from those. There are alternatives you can use. Um, instead of using weed killers, you can use a heavy mulch um, you know, to keep the weeds down. Um, you can dig the weeds up. Sometimes you have to dig them up three or four times. It's a long, arduous process. Some people use, um, instead, of, instead of the regular mulch, they use a plastic mulch. Um, and um, you know they, they use a good quality loom that doesn't have any seeds in it. So there are other alternatives you can use uh, besides uh, herbicides. So same thing with chemical pesticides. There are ways, and we also do have a presentation on companion planting. Um, so you can use, um, uh, for, for example, you can, you can you can uh, plant marigolds. Not only, I'm sure the, the, the uh, pollinators might like them, but they also deter some, some pests from your garden. So be aware that the chemicals that don't kill us uh, may kill the, the, the pollinators in our area. So uh, another thing is if you are gonna grow some of these perennials to keep, uh, you know, to entice your, your pollinators, you're gonna grow some perennial flowers, uh, be, be aware that Growing perennials year after year in the same place requires a replenishment of nutrients into the soil. And, and a good way to do that is by using your own compost that you collect, your own grass clippings in your, in your um, uh, fall, fallen leaves, you know, leaves in the fall, your own uh, uh, coffee grounds, your eggshells, your, your le spent lettuce, and all your vegetable matter. So it's a good way to, to, uh, to help grow your plants that will in feed the, um, the pollinators that will, and the pollinators will feed your, your crops and it's a closed loop system. So we love organic gardens as much as your flowers do. Um, they are, weeds love them. And as I say, you put a good uh, deal of mulch on there, pine mulch, straw mulch, chopped up fall leaves. Um, and each of those will turn to compost over time and will nourish your, your pollinator gardens. So, okay, so, and these are interesting links. This is one good reason um, that you may want this presentation. Um, um, Home Depot's Lowe's, they all have organic garden soils and garden tools that, that you may want. Um, the New England Wildflower Society is a great resource for buying uh, native plants, programs, and uh, resources. The Vermont Wildflower Farm provides you from seeds that you can purchase online. If you want to purchase those lovely uh, dandelions uh, seed, you can get that. And also, my that's a link to my website. Uh, we can also answer any questions and provide services that can help your your garden grow. I'm not trying to plug here, so, but we can. So um, that's our presentation today. Um, do you, how did you, did you catch, collect any questions or? Uh, I don't have any questions just yet, but I encourage okay. people to do, go ahead and use the chat box and um, type in any question that you want. Um, some of the unusual things that uh, you've seen, Kate, in, in gardening, do people have a, um, do you see the same thing over and over again as to what they're, what they want to attract? Um, in other words, do people want to have more butterflies in their garden? I think so. I think so. I think the main, 
So yes, I think that's, that's, that's true. A lot of people like butterflies because butterflies are pretty. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of times people do is they um, entice the butterflies and they grow a butterfly bush, for example. Um, they'll grow a, and you'll have a wonderful butterfly bush, except the, the, the butterflies will, will eat, but then they'll die there because you don't have the host, uh, the, um, you don't have the, um, the, the plant there that they, uh, they, the milkweed? see it's a milkweed. Yeah. They, you won't, you won't have that growing. So I see that a lot. And, uh, and I think people that, you know, that grow for food, what they want to see is they want to see an increase in their food. So, uh, and that's where the rubber meets the road. The, the, I don't know, I don't know. I, I think people should, should understand that. I mean, let, let me just give you a, a, little, a little tiny uh, tidbit here. I, I was, uh, was um, paid by the uh, senior center in, in Marlboro. They, they had a big, huge greenhouse and they wanted to uh, start a garden for the seniors. And I said, well, that's a great greenhouse and we can start a garden for you. But if you want a garden and you want to grow things like cucumbers and squash, um, you know, they, they need to pollinate and there's no bees in there. So, you know, so there's all these subtleties. And so we had to buy special varieties and do special things. And, uh, but, but the bees do a lot of work and they increase your yields astronomically in the in the garden so um and i i, I i'm not sure whether people actually um typically raise a, a grow i hear a lot of people want the butterflies but i don't i don't know of anybody that except someone who really knows what they're doing that will actually grow uh be cognitive enough to grow a garden to entice bees because people are afraid that bees are going to hurt them Bees don't hurt you. They, you, if as long as you leave them alone, to, you know they'll. Um, they're too busy eating. They're busy bees. They, they don't want to bother with us. So, That's, any questions? Uh, no questions. So I think I think we'll wrap it up. I want okay. to thank everyone for joining us today and. Um, I, again, I want to thank the Community Garden Club of Cohasset for sponsoring this and Kate for uh, taking some time out from her day to give us this presentation. We will be posting this on our website, cohassetlibrary.org, uh, under the YouTube channel, uh, which oddly is, uh, if you go to YouTube, it, you have to search uh, by Paul Pratt Memorial Library. We've got a dual personality going on there, Cohasset Library versus Paul Pratt Memorial Library. It's the same thing. Um, but we'll be getting that up in the next few days. Other than that, I, I just, think- It's just one thing, if sure. I could, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I, I can give you, I, I, I want people to be able to get this presentation. So, and I don't, I don't post my presentations on um, Facebook, so I'm going to give you my email. Is that the best way to do it? So someone could email and I'll sure. send the presentation. Okay, sure. so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on here. Bear with me. I'm gonna just I'm still sharing. So um, <laughs> all right. Let me do In the this. meantime, if uh, if if people want to get a hold of me, I can certainly pass along that information. Um, I can be reached at gwalsh at ocln.org, or you can uh, ask Kate directly at this address here. Okay, that's the that's the email if anybody wants to um, to write that down. So wonderful. All right, very good. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Happy gardening, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, happy gardening. <clears throat>